5.15. Okay, uh, before I call the meeting to order, there's an overflow. Okay, let's, let's get this show on the road. But for the people that are not on the committee, there's an overflow, 5.15, if you want to go, because we can only have so many people. And our presenters, somebody find a seat for Senator Burke, who's going to, Senator Burke, if there's nobody, don't get, now sit down, Kathleen. One of the boys can get up. <laughs> In fact, Dave, that's a really good idea. Thank you as a legislator for doing that. Right there, Senator Burke. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. And... Let's see, we're going. Okay, and for the uh, committee to know, uh, Senator Kay Kirkpatrick's bill, uh, Senate Bill 417 is not on today. The Senate passed out Dave Belton's bill yesterday and hers was attached to it, so um, that one is being done. And as legislators, you need to pick up your own bills. We have no help. Did you pick them up? They're down here on the corner, or maybe one of you can help us, or I'll come down there and help you. Huh? Okay, there are three bills. Who doesn't have bills? Thank you to my vice chair for filling one of your jobs you didn't know you had as vice chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, in letting l ladies go first, uh, I'm going to call Senator Say, and if you will succinctly present your bill, it's another one of those compact bills. Let's get them, yes, from the podium, let's get these compact bills out of here, if at all possible, and get them over with. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Hang on, and let's Not Senate Bill... Yet. 306, and you want to give us the number for it? Um, it's Senate Bill 306. LC? Um, they, uh, shoot. Hmm. You tell me I got all my stuff together. Come on. I don't have Well, it's 3643, 25S. Sure I'm getting what y'all are working from, too, though. I that apologize, way? Madam Chair. Who's this? Which, which one are we working off of? Do y'all, anybody have it? It's have L it what I have is LC 3625S. That sounds right. Okay, go ahead. Um, as you all probably know, we in the Senate just passed House Bill 752 unanimously, and that's dealing with uh, physical therapy, which is another compact bill, and I think the chairman just alluded to it. Uh, this particular bill is dealing with the speech, language, and audiologies. Um, that is another compact bill that we would like to have happen here in Georgia so that the numbers that we don't have, that we're short, I mean, we're growing in Georgia, but we need to provide health care to all of Georgians. And this way we can have therapists uh, around surrounding areas from other district or from other states actually, because it's a compact, to be able to come in and practice. Um, but that's, you know, the genesis of what I am trying to do. Uh, I was privileged to have been asked to come to Washington, D.C. to meet with the industry uh, so that we, as other legislators from around the nation, was able to understand what compacts does and how it can help each of us in our states. Um, the, this bill accomplishes three main things. It permits speech language pathologists and or audi audiologists to obtain one license which will allow them a privilege to practice in multiple states. Number two, it supports spouses and active duty military personnel when they are relocating. And it allows greater access to speech language pathology and audiology services in rural areas through the use of telehealth. So those are the three main objectives that we are trying to accomplish with that. 
but some of the important points currently speech language and pathologies and speech language pathologists and audiologists working in Georgia are licensed and regulated through the Secretary of State this compact will not change any existing rules and regulations of the licensing board speech language pathologists and audiologists providing services in a remote state are subject to that state's regulatory authority. They will have to follow the rules, regulations, and laws in the state where they are working. Currently in Georgia, there is a phys uh, physician on the licensure board, so there will continue to be physician oversight of speech language pathology and audiologists working in Georgia. Telehealth for speech language pathology and audiology services has been very effective and beneficial for patients, particularly during this pandemic of COVID-19. That's my presentation, Madam Chair. Um, if there are questions, I will certainly <coughs> try to answer. I do have some of the professionals that are here today, um, and I am very thankful for you all's colleague in the House uh, Representative Belton, who has said before you asked, he would be willing to carry it for me. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, a unanimous pass. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, for members, please tell us your mic number, but when you, you know, if you push it, we know yours is one. Right. Uh, because you're sitting in different places. Uh, Representative Petrie, you had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator, uh, for being here. Um, I wanted to just make sure uh, I appreciate uh, you, you spoke on issue with spouses of active duty military personnel, real important in my area. I just wanted to just, I know this, is, uh, having read through this, I know this to be true, but I want to emphasize. So all of the regulatory authority of this state would be intact, and everyone would be held to the same, uh, same regulatory standards. That's correct. Regardless, correct? Yeah, thank you, Senator. <coughs> Mike 10, Representative Bennett. And if you're on the sides, you don't have a mic somewhere along the way, over back on this side, just raise your hand if somebody doesn't have a mic. Okay, Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator C, for bringing this awesome bill. I just want to offer my support and, and understanding and for the need for the compact. And thank you, and thank my colleagues also for carrying it on the House side. Are there other questions from committee members? Pick up copies of your bills right there. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, Representative Belton, I know you're dying to speak, so you have less, you have a minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. This will be very brief. Uh, I I gave you all a letter in red, yellow, green. On one side is the green. That's the stuff that we did before. This is a letter from the Pentagon specifically asking for these things. The things we did before was, or was last year is all in green. The letter, the, the yellow, red, and green is, is what their requests are for us now. And this is specifically a request from the Pentagon for this specific bill. So I hope you all can pass it for us. Thank you. Representative Belton. I am all for the armed services. My husband was a colonel in the re full bird colonel in the retired Air Force. However, this bill doesn't just affect Air Force or Army or Navy or people in the armed services, correct? It does, you know, affect all of the people in Georgia and people that, you know, that do these professions, correct? That's exactly right, ma'am. Okay. So, and you're in favor of it yes, also because it does affect general citizens and their ability to get these services across yes, our state. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. So, is there anybody else that wants to speak briefly to the bill? Oh, nobody, nobody else. Okay. What is the pleasure of the committee? Okay, we have a uh, motion to do pass and a second. Okay, is there any further discussion on the bill? 
Okay, seeing no further discussion, uh, everyone in favor of the passage of Senate Bill 306 say aye. aye. Anyone opposed, no? Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee members. Thank you. Right, uh, Senator Burke. And Senator Burke is bringing us a substitute to Senate Bill 482. You should have it. It would be LC 338403S. Everybody got a copy? Oh, okay. okay. Just a second, Senator. We'll get him a copy. Everybody else has the correct version? Okay. Jesse was doing his homework. He read the bills ahead of time, and so that's why he has the old copy. That's it. There's the way to go. That is. Well, we are in that time when things get changed very quickly and so forth. And the, the senator did let me know that he was uh, making the, basically a minor change. Okay, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Appreciate you having me here, especially during this uh, truncated session that we're, we're dealing with. And I'm, I'm gonna be probably a little briefer than normal. Be glad to, to answer uh, questions. But again, because everybody's schedules are compressed, I, I respect everyone's time. Uh, basically, this bill uh, allows us, the state of Georgia to develop what's called an all-payer claims database. Uh, and uh, this uh, is not a new s subject. Uh, in fact, uh, Representative Hawkins' bill that got picked by rules a little while ago to be on the floor tomorrow, uh, House Bill, I believe, 888, uh, actually has a, uh, a section in it that uh, contemplates us setting up an all-player claims database okay. because it is kind of a no-brainer from the standpoint of getting the information that we as policymakers need to make health care decisions. This bill just goes into detail on how that's done. So uh, it, it uh, contemplates an advisory board uh, and uh, the right infrastructure. It contemplates uh, funding both from the uh, small amount from the state, but also most states have uh, sell some of the information to, to vendors that need that kind of data. So they make a lot of the, the money that the state spends back by, by fees. And then uh, the philanthropic community that are, uh, the healthcare uh, philanthropic community also has a stake in getting this kind of data and frequently a lot of states have found that some of those uh, types of organizations will actually help, help fund it. So uh, I think the amount of money required for, for this sort of uh, 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 database is a lot less than it used to be because um, more than 30 states in the country currently either have one or are putting one together like this. So we're not starting from scratch. Um, I do have with me here today uh, as a guest, uh, the uh, director of the Health Analytics and Informatics at Georgia Tech, which is contemplated to be doing the work for this because they're already doing this work uh, on a federal basis for the CDC and the uh, FDA, uh, Dr. John Duke is sitting here and I'd like for him at least just to say hello to y'all and, okay. and explain in the real world what, what, what they do every day. And I'd like for him to uh, help me emphasize why in this truncated season and with our limited budget, why this type of legislation is, is important. Well, for the committee before you, and we certainly have uh, your guest uh, speak to us, can you explain to the committee what we're gonna do with this, you know, what just a briefing what the all payer claims database, how we're gonna use that and what value it has? Certainly. For, uh, I'm not sure all the committee members know. I'll look at uh, lines 155 to 164. Uh, there's a listing of the types of things that are, that are done in uh, all payer claims database. And for those that are interested, there is a national council of all payer claims database that shares best practices they have a website, and on their website, they have links to states all payer claims database so you can see what other states are doing with this information. One that I thought was extremely uh, valuable was Tennessee's. 
Uh, if you're going to have a knee replacement in Tennessee, you can go plug that in and you can find out the data on who does them, how much they cost, and what their quality information is with a push of a button as a consumer. I mean, I think most of us just dream of that kind of information in the hands of, of our constituents. So, uh, but, but the... Okay, Dean Burks, is this the kind of thing that we could use, um, Dr. Burkford, I mean, about... 12 or so years ago at a meeting of the Southern Legislative Exchange Group, or whatever it's called, in Alabama, a small college in Mobile, Alabama, had come up with a computer program. And they had put all of their physicians and that, you know, that took Medicaid and all in the state of Mississippi on that. And they were able to, you know, equal them out as far as the kind of patients they had and they were able to take the ones that were getting the best healthcare outcomes using the, like one thing, the less narcotics, the ones that were in the middle, and then the ones where it was costing more with fewer uh, positive outcomes, more use of narcotics and this kind of thing, and so that they were able to take the people in the top level, the doctors there, and what they had learned, and try to help the ones in the lower one in the middle improve their practices. This was 10 or 12 years ago. I brought that pay, I brought that computer disk home to DCH at the time and it was free and they could have used it. So are we finally coming to where that is the kind of information that we are going to be able to get and to be able to use to improve healthcare in Georgia? That, that is just a very small amount of that type of information that we could could get we can get the same information on pharmacy claims right uh, I mean this health care disparities you know what part of our state has poor outcomes and then we can start figuring out why um, you know the 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 problem with something like this truly is trying to manage it is there are so many opportunities is trying to narrow it down where you can do it right, right. And, and not be overwhelmed by the fact that, you know, which one of the thousand things out there we could study do we need to do first? first. Uh, and again, that's why the, the advisory board is made up of people from all parts of health care so that input can be given. And I think I've talked to the National Council, the, their, their board chairs and, and so forth that have been doing this for years. And, and that was one of the things they stressed the most is to pick out a few things that you want to start with and set up the systems, which is where the technology people come in to make sure you're getting that data. And, you know, there's, there's data in, data out. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're not get collecting it properly, your, your result that you get at the end is not going to be very helpful. But isn't that the case where the people that run the computers and know all, understand all this, which I have no understanding of whatsoever, I think I saw some company that it did it in Ohio on maternal uh, and uh, infant care. And as far as decreasing low birth weights, they were able to run studies and they showed the, the different things that you might do to improve and not have so many children born with low birth weights. And there was one thing, significant thing they could do that would have been lowered that by 90%, so that there are ways to even take care of that. Well, with artificial intelligence, Madam Chair, it's amazing what what advances that we can come up with, uh, with when we have all of all of the data in one place. And and, and again, that's the, the the idea here is if we can get in most states 80 to 90 percent of, of claims flowing through this, then we will have a huge tool that we can use to. To improve health care and health care costs and health care access. I mean, it's just go on and on and on. So, thank you. I just wanted to, because of that, and go ahead, I'm sorry, I interrupted, but well, th this Dr. is Duke. extremely important. Dr. Dr. Duke, I think, are you the one or t one of two MDs at Georgia Tech? Uh, There's two of us. There yeah, now. yeah, he's okay. a cohort of two. No, <laughs> well, welcome to the Health and Human Services Committee. Sorry, it's a little crazy, all of us behind masks and uh, well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair and, and committee members. I appreciate uh, Senator Burke's invitation. Uh, again, my name is John Duke. Um, I'm an internal medicine uh, physician and, and informatician. I direct our Center for Health Analytics and Informatics at Georgia Tech. Um, and I just wanted to, to really just share a couple thoughts 
uh, that, that I think are important uh, to Georgians, important to all of us uh, that relate to the APCD on uh, the question of you know, why, why take this on now and, and then really just open time for questions. Um, this is a, a time where I think uh, there's a lot of belt tightening amongst everyone, of course, including the state, but individuals and families as well. A lot of insurance changes that people are going to see, people that were insured through employers uh, shifting to perhaps being either self-insured or on higher deductible plans. A lot of decisions people need to make about costs where they're going to be bearing those costs themselves and being able to get information to them about those costs and about quality becomes that much more important and vital to people um, at this time. At the same time, I think healthcare providers and healthcare systems are really thinking a lot about their own models. They're in flux. They've obviously created a lot of um, uh, new buildings and new centers around kind of the, the prior model they're trying to figure out. But they've also discovered as telemedicine very rapidly flourished under the pressure of, of the, the epidemic, um, that it is a way to deliver care effectively, regardless whether you're in rural communities or urban communities, wherever you may be, uh, and it's seeing a lot of growth and traction. The question is, are we getting the same quality? And in order to answer those questions for both us as consumers and the healthcare systems, they need to be able to look at those data. And what you can do in APCD is not only ask the classic uh, cost and quality questions, but begin looking at some of these new approaches, new interventions, and explore, is this a better way to provide care regardless of the scenario going forward one year, two years, three years out? I also want to highlight something that we, we described as an epidemic just a few months ago. That was the opioid epidemic. So before we kind of were dealing with COVID, I think we all recognize the cost and impact in, a he in health and burden financially and beyond that that has on our communities. Some of the most uh, uh, impressive studies done with all payers claims databases are around opiates. A really amazing study out of Colorado is where they looked at surgeries, at all type of orthopedic surgeries, to see which ones were most likely that the patients would end up on long-term opioids and develop habit-forming uh, use of opioids. And that is something that can occur where someone has no prior exposure right. And then they go in for a knee surgery, a back surgery, uh, a ACL tear, and develop dependence. And there's been some really amazing studies that help us understand the seeds. And I think those kind of topics are incredibly ripe for, for understanding. The really, really nice thing about APCDs, I think Senator Burke mentioned 30 states either have them or developing them, is there's a community of researchers and there's common data models and there's things that we can share and leverage. So we don't have to start, number one, a hospital by itself doesn't have to figure out how to do artificial intelligence and analyze their own data. It can be done as part of a larger effort, and we can work within Georgia, across organizations, and across states to answer those kinds of common questions. Uh, so th those are just some overview thoughts. I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from the committee for the doctor? No, I think we're probably just gonna wait and start seeing the information when this system gets developed and. Uh, see what kind of information you can give us to, and what we need to do, what laws we need to change or legislation we need to move uh, to help you know, utilize the information that we find. We've got a question. Okay. Uh, Representative Newton first, okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for that. Uh, and I think this is a great step forward. You mentioned, I think, um, like looking at orthopedic surgeries, whether it's spine or uh, other, others, knee surgery, whatever, and then comparing the long-term uh, narcotic use and all. Uh, on the list of submitting entities, I do see Board of Workmen's Comp, uh, Cannabis Commission, all the insurance payers and all. Is there a way where we needed this to include um, our PDMP, our PMP, where it sounds like that may have been something that was valuable in another area? We have, we do try to protect and de-identify data in that uh, uh, prescription data monitoring database, uh, certainly. Just like all healthcare information, de-identifying and all, would would it be good to have that as a submitting entity too, or is it too late to consider something like this? May be more of a question for the author, but since you brought it up, I thought I'd at least. Um, and it, the ultimate I love the answer idea. Right, might be more on, on on Senator Burke, but I would say absolutely, we want a comprehensive uh, uh, report of all of the narcotics that patients are receiving, whether that's documented through a pharmacy reimbursement through claims or from another source. So. Uh, if that's not incorporated, if PDMP data uh, is not redundant, but rather provides information yeah. on top of it, I would expect that you would want to add that. Um, and maybe Dr. Burke can, can comment if those data are already 
I'll, I'll leave that as a question for the bill author. Okay. So. And, all right. Look. I do. Dr. Burke, do you want to comment on that? Well, well one thing that, that uh, the reason we're setting up a, an advisory council that they will then promulgate rules is, is to capture that kind of information. There, there really is no yeah. way in the bill itself to contemplate every particular I, place that we may need it. So most of this is because these bills have been passed in so many states, most of the things that are specifically mentioned were barriers in other states. That, that they had resistance, so we want to make sure right. you know that we're supposed to do this. The PDMPs in public health, I feel pretty comfortable that that kind of information, you know, can be shared amongst our Right, our Re and Representative Newton, I don't think, agencies. sorry, I thought you were through, I'm sorry. Right. I don't think that's the kind of thing that we can add at the last minute. Okay. I mean, there are so many issues around that as far as protection of patient information and all. I would think that if it becomes a problem that we'd have to come back and very quickly change that, but also to protect people. I know that there were, was a big feeling in the legislature of being very protective. For years, we wouldn't share it with anybody across state lines. They finally gave in to that. So I would be very leery of trying to write and change this at the last minute. Sure. Are, is that? Yeah, and that's fair, and I think a lot of these uh, controversial uh, data feed, so to speak, and they've been litigated already. You know, the, the other states have, have run into the barriers and, and they've gone to court and they've kind of settled that process. And my understanding is the few states that have done this lately have not had those kinds of territorial no kind of issues because those, those uh, cases have already been made. And so again, I can't specifically speak to the PDMP because of that legislation, but the, I think there's no problem with the, that the identified information moving into the, this repository. Sure. Ask Go ahead. Sure. Follow up. I think uh, that's absolutely right, and certainly that information is captured in the in the payment schedule too, right. when the pharmacy gets paid. One last little quick question, just for my information. I apologize. Line twenty three mentions an administrator of the Georgia uh, All Payer Claims Database. And then on line 67, there's mentioned a director, and it doesn't necessarily say who appoints the director. It does say down below who the governor appoints, the, the speaker appoints someone, the lieutenant governor does. I just was curious, am I, on line 67, the director who shall serve as the chairperson, is that also the administrator? And if so, who, or not, and, if, and who appoints that director? I mean, the, typically be the governor, I would think, but it, since it you listed the, down below. It is the governor, um, and I, I don't have the, the section, but that contemplates the, the same person that's going to be managing the 1135 waiver in that health act that we passed last year. That's a position that the governor is not appointed yet, but it's in statute, uh, and that, is, that would be that. That's who that director is. is uh, uh, identified with. Okay, so that, I, I just saw down on like line 71, it mentions that person is appointed by the governor. This just understood that the director is appointed by the governor, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Hawkins. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you know, and I know the Senator is fully aware of the, of the bill, surprise bill is coming on the floor of the Senate tomorrow, and part of that bill, uh, we're angling toward uh, accessing an all payers data claim base. But the problem we've run into is if we have to purchase one, it becomes very expensive and in this time of need. Uh, my question to you is um, it, also what we're going to be uh, relying on in the beginning are data calls by the COS, Commissioner of Insurance, who does data calls on the health insurance groups. But as you alluded to, it is not complete. It's just bursts of information on certain procedures. It's not timely updated and that type of thing. Um, is your plan here to be timely updated? And also, can you glean the information to subtract Medicaid, Medicare uh, data from that when we're figuring, uh, you know, our contracted rates? Because that's going to be important for our providers not to have that figured into that rate. I think the short answer is yes, but Dr. Duke, do you want to explain how that happens in a 100,000 foot level? You may need to come to the yeah, mic. Yeah, go to the mic, if you would please, sir. 
I think that's a, a very important question. And indeed, many of these different uh, uh, data sources. So claims does have a certain snapshot that can be valuable for its volume, but it's you know missing some certain uh, details that you can get into other areas. I think that one of the key pieces is, yes, we, we are able to bring in the data uh, separately uh, in you know, it's identifiable when it comes in. We have to then de-identify it, put it into a common data model. Then we can harmonize it across individuals so that we can account for uh, those, those, those overlaps uh, and be sure that we're, you know, kind of uh, clarifying what are the pieces that are, you know, sort of shown twice. I think the other question is how do you then bring in um, other data sources should they become available that can fill in some of the gaps that you don't have in claims and how do you get the timeliness of it? Well, because there's 30 other states with APCDs, uh, the Anthems and Blue Cross, they've become pretty familiar to this request. Uh, so maybe right. the first time around, it was like, well, it's going to take us six months to pull those data together. Right. But now, now, now it's become pretty standard. So there's a, a, a process uh, that is, is, is in place where they can move pretty rapidly to turn around data, at least monthly, uh, if not more frequently. Uh, so I think the timeliness is less of an issue now than it probably was when these first began. And it can be done Medicaid, Medicare free? Uh, y yes, yeah, exactly, right, exactly, yes. Good. It, they That's going to be important that. too. Absolutely, yeah. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, um, and, and Senator Burke, maybe I just missed this. Um, we're passing this bill, and we're going to be, are we going to be waiting on funding, or is there some movement that we may be starting this fairly soon or well um, the bill contemplates you know having to be funded before right. before we can go forward uh, I, as a budgeteer on the Senate side I'm I'm, I'm working on that so. okay I'm just gonna say there's a push for us to be able to start this at a, a reasonable rate to get this underway to help Ab with our delivery I'm, of health care in Georgia thank thank you Okay, had, go ahead, or did you finish your presentation? No, I was about to use a word I probably shouldn't have anyway, so. <laughs> I was gonna do my darndest to make uh, it Oh, did do your darndest, okay. Yeah, yeah right, well, I've, I've, as you know, we've discussed another issue on maternal mortality, and I appreciate all your efforts of trying and helping me in any way uh, to get funding even in this terrible budgeting time to start our work on reducing the number of mothers we lose across this state especially in our African-American uh, uh, members, which there's a high rate, something like three times uh, the okay. Caucasian rate. So thank you for all that help. Um, are there questions for the senator? Any more questions for the senator? Okay, uh, what's the committee's position? Okay, Representative Newton. We have a due pass, about several seconds. Okay, any further discussion? Is there anybody else that would like to speak on the bill? Uh, other, okay. Yeah, I'll leave it to the pharmacist. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. And I'll be <laughs> very, very, very brief. Uh, I'd like to commend Senator Burke for, for this piece of legislation. The Pharmacy Association is strongly in support. You know, good data is, and good data-driven de driven decisions are, are Georgia's best chance to do the very things that's the purpose of the bill, improve access, quality, and reduce costs. So strongly in support of this legislation. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Senator Burke, before I forget it, we take the final vote. Please go by the rules, the House Rules Chairman's Office as soon as you leave here. Fill out the forms. We apparently are not having committees meet quickly enough, and there's a, a lack of Senate bills to even be considered. So if you get on the docket early, you might get considered more quickly, and you might be to your advantage. So please go as soon as you leave here. And I'd already told Senator Say to do that um, before. Okay, so we have a motion to pass, and we are standing to pass the substitute to Senate Bill 482, LC 338403S. Everyone in favor say aye. aye. Anyone opposed, no? The ayes have it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, just go now and do your duty and work on getting it out of rules. So. Okay, uh, the next bill up, and, and uh, okay, is Senate Bill 372. This is a housekeeping bill uh, for public health, and it is Senate, it, uh, Senator Tillery's bill. Senator Tillery is one of the governor's floor leaders, or was when this bill started. Uh, now he is the appropriations chair, and out of a courtesy to him, 
uh, the fact that he is working on the budget, and since House members often, there are things we want in the budget and want to see happen, uh, I had told him he did not have to come to the meeting. Uh, and Megan uh, from Public Health, I told her she could present the bill. So Megan, tell them who you are for the ones that don't know, and let's go with this bill. All right, thank you, Representative Cooper. My name is Megan Andrews. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, as Representative Cooper mentioned, this is a cleanup bill for the department. What it's doing is going through um, Georgia code and eliminating unnecessary administrative burdens on the department that's in Georgia code. Um, and so the purpose of this is so Georgia code is an accurate reflection of the true work of public health um, in its current state. And um, I can briefly walk through the changes um, so you all have an idea and there's one I'll go into a little more detail on. Um, the first one is a naloxone update um, and this will allow first responders to purchase naloxone for um, under a federal program and I have someone here who can answer questions if you have questions on that. Um, section two is just removing an administrative burden of the clerk of court mailing um, orders to the Department of Public Health regarding um, age transmitting crimes. There's another one where we're receiving court orders regarding um, health care facility transfers as well. That's also an unnecessary administrative burden. Section three is a bill that passed last year, the child marriage um, bill. It had the Department of Public Health creating a fact sheet regarding child marriages. That fact sheet has been created, but there was um, a section in there requiring the department to adopt rules and regulations on the fact sheet, which is um, unnecessary. And we went to write the rules and didn't really know what to say. So um, it's just removing that section. Section four is regarding the Office of Women's Health that exists within the department. This um, was established in 2011 when DPH became a standalone agency. This advisory council that Georgia Code mentions has never met, never been appointed. So it's eliminating that, but it's also expanding the scope of work of our Office of Women's Health. Right now, they're limited to um, non-reproductive health issues, so this is expanding it to also examine reproductive health is issues, which touches on the maternal mortality issue that we've been heavily involved in. So. It's just bringing Georgia code in line with the current work of the department. Um, the one I wanna go into a little more detail on is section five. This is for vital records. So currently, if um, 100 years after a date of birth, we send those records to state archives. This year is the first year that that's happening because um, it's the first year that we have records to transfer to them. Um, but with people living longer, we don't want to be transferring records for public consumption to state archives for our over 100 population that are still alive. So this is allowing us to hold on to the records at Vital Records until um, 125 years have elapsed since the date of birth, and this will help us protect um, our vulnerable, el very elderly citizens that are over 100 years old. Um, there were some questions on that, so I just wanted to make that clear. In other words, if you send them over to the archives, uh, um, people doing just general genealogy studies and stuff could go, or anybody could go in there and they could get people's Person. personal information and social security number or just general information? They're, yeah, they can get a copy of their birth certificate. So this is allowing it to stay with vital records and limiting the population that can get the birth certificate to immediate family members or those that are, you know, appointed guardians of these elderly populations. So it limits kind of the access to on a need to know basis. Okay, cuz somebody so somebody that's 109 years old couldn't have their personal information put out. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, but we do our vital records office does allow if the person is deceased anyone can get a copy of the birth certificate. Um, it's just we're trying to do this to protect the people that are still alive from their personal information being out there. Okay. Um, the Next section, chapter 16, regarding chronic renal disease patients. That passed in the 1970s, um, and as far back as our team can go, we haven't found any record of um, this advisory committee or work of this, um, of this commission that was appointed in Georgia Code. Um, so it's just eliminating that. 
Section seven is about healthcare facilities. This is another one where we're getting um, court orders that are unnecessary for us to receive. And then the very last section, section eight, um, is going through Georgia code and replacing venereal disease with sexually transmitted disease to bring it in line with um, CDC definitions and terms. And that is all I have. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Okay. Questions for Ms. Megan from the committee. Everybody's fresh out of questions? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We've got a motion to move. Uh, got a second? Okay. Got a second? Okay. Uh, is there anybody in the audience that wants to speak to the bill? Well, seeing no one. Okay. Uh, everyone in favor of the passage of Senate Bill 372, LC33A288S, say yay. yay. Anyone opposed? Nay. <laughs> oh, well, y'all are really quiet today. Okay, <laughs> I thought I'd do that up a little bit. Okay, you have a passage. Uh, Megan, I would suggest strongly that you go by the rules office, that you pick up the form that perhaps you fill it out and that you take it over today and have the chairman sign it and approve it or whatever you can do. Got it. And so we can get this bill moving. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you and very much. thank you for much. wearing your masks. Okay. <laughs> um, and I believe that's the end of our meeting today. Um, I had hoped that uh, we would have one meeting, that that's all I would have. There is one bill that's sort of pending. There are two bills that are out there. There is some discussion about one being better than the other one and which one's going to move. And I have suggested that they make a decision and put them together and get the best bill out there. Uh, and if so, I don't know whether it'll be coming to us or it'll be going to another committee. Uh, so everybody just stay tuned. But thank you very much for uh, committing. If this is our last meeting, uh, as always, I think I have the best committee in the whole Georgia House. Uh, I have certainly the most people that show up for the meetings for such a large committee. And I appreciate your diligence and your work and the questions you ask and how we move good legislation for Georgia. So thank you very much. And we are adjourned.